Oh, please. Is this working? So please take your seats. I want to find out actually if the microphone is working. It's hard to tell with all this background noise, but I think now it's fine, right? Okay, so um, welcome to this evening session. I'm Frank Kirchhoff and it's my pleasure to introduce briefly today's keynote speaker, um, Warner Green. So currently Warner is the director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology and a Sue Harman Distinguished Professor, maybe you explain later what exactly this is, of Translational Medicine at uh, the University of California in San Francisco. Now, Warner is in the business for a few years already, um, and he <laughs> actually got his PhD back in 1971, in, uh, sorry, it's bachelor's uh, degree in Stanford in 1971 and his MD-PhD from Washington University School of Medicine in 1977. Um, thereafter, he completed his res uh, residency training in internal medicine at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. And uh, from 1979 to 86, he served first as a postdoc and then as a senior investigator at the NCI where he also established his own group. Now, I think during that time, Borner also was here the first time to learn a really new, sophisticated, difficult method called molecular cloning. <laughs> and um, obviously, he did well uh, because afterwards, he was actually appointed a professor of medicine, microbiology. Uh, sorry, he was first you have too many professorships, Warner. I have to. Well, I have the wrong one now. So he was subsequently uh, he became professor of medicine at Duke University, and investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Now then, finally, he settled down in 1992, and uh, this was in San Francisco, where he became the founding director and the senior investigator uh, of the Gladstone Institute. Um, he was also appointed a professor of medicine, microbiology, and immunology at UCSF. Now, Warner has performed really numerous uh, studies, and I'm certainly not going to go into any detail here to downtake up all of his time. And uh, he has really done, uh, uh, provides some fundamental insights into the pathogenesis of human retroviruses. And um, currently, his main research focus is on the interplay between HIV and immune cells. I guess with a goal to understand the mechanisms underlying viral transmission, latency, and pathogenicity. So Warner has published more than 350 papers, many of them really in high-impact journals, and he has been recognized as one of the 100 most cited uh, scientists in the world. He has a long list of awards, memberships, and just to name a few, maybe uh, uh, the academies of microbiology, cell biology, and advancement of science. And he also served recently as the president of the Association of American Physicians. So Warner is also really involved very much in teaching, and he has trained about 120 students, many of which actually became independent researchers and are still in the field. And finally, I found, personally, I found it particularly impressive that he is also president or was president and is cur uh, currently executive chairman of the Accordia Global Health Foundation and uh, still manages to devote a lot of his time to actually fighting AIDS in Africa by building new centers of excellent, uh, excellence and establishing medical and basic research institutions. Okay, so I, I hardly I think this is just the maximum number of nice words I ever said in my life about a person. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to stop here now and uh, not steal all his time. And I look forward to your presentation now. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I'm not going to use that. Thank you very much, Frank, for that warm introduction. It is a pleasure to be back in Cold Spring Harbor uh, after the molecular cloning course uh, nearly 30 years ago. Tom Maniatis was teaching it. It was amazing, an absolutely amazing experience. 
What I'd like to do in the next 40, 45 minutes is to tell you a story about T cell death and chronic inflammation and how this pair has coupled in a, in a very strange and unexpected uh, way. But let me first begin with an overview of where we stand with HIV, and I want to tell you a personal story about my involvement with HIV in, in Africa. Currently, 34 million people infected with the virus, 26 million dead. Um, uh, most historians would right now rank it as the fourth worst epidemic in, uh, in human history after the Black Plague, smallpox, uh, the great influenza. 70% um, of all new HIV infections and 70% of all people living with HIV reside in sub-Saharan Africa. I became involved, as Frank was mentioning, as president of the, uh, the Accordia Global Health Foundation with an effort to combat infectious disease in Uganda, uh, first in, in Uganda, here in East Africa. And I'd like to tell you a story about my first trip uh, there in 2004. Um, I had not been to Africa prior to that. Uh, I'd been working on HIV for many years, but I would realize after this trip that I did not understand HIV until I went to Africa. Uh, when I got off the plane in Entebbe, you remember this was the, where the Israelis, the raid on Entebbe, I looked up in the sky and I saw this. This is a marabou stork. Now, it's kind of an ugly bird. It gets better when you get close. These are some of the, I mean, these, these birds could eat a small child. Uh, now, not all the birds in, in, in Uganda are ugly. This is the gray-crowned uh, uh, crane, which is the national bird. Uh, but that marabou stork was very imposing. On the way into town from Entebbe uh, to uh, Kampala, I was struck by the number, by the businesses along the road. And the most common business was making of coffins. Now, this is in 2004. You can see big coffins for adults, uh, small coffins for children. These are all coffins that people with HIV infection and AIDS will ultimately be buried in. I remember going Monday morning to the clinic uh, at the Infectious Diseases Institute in Kampala. It was packed with people, but I tell you, you could have heard a pen drop. It was so quiet in that room. I came back to the clinic the next day on Tuesday, and it was completely different. The kids were running around, people were chattering and laughing and, and, and greeting old friends. And I said to the nurse, I said, what's the difference? And she said, oh, it's very clear. On Monday, they were running the antiretroviral clinic. They, these were all patients that were on antiretroviral medicines. I'm sorry, on Tuesday, they were running the antiretroviral clinic. Um, and whereas on Monday, those individuals were, uh, had no medicines. They were not receiving treatment for their, for their HIV infection. So that prompted me to write, my, my trip report was entitled, Turning Mondays into Tuesdays. Um, and the power of antiretroviral therapy to lift people's lives with this viral infection is absolutely uh, overwhelming. Currently, we have 34 million people, as I said, uh, infected in the world. Of that 34 million, uh, 15 million people uh, currently urgently need antiretroviral therapy based on the original WHO guideline of, 350, uh, of treating at 350 cells, uh, uh, CD4 uh, cells. Now you know that that guideline has been increased to 500. So in fact, well over 15, I mean probably uh, 20 to 25 million people now uh, require treatment. At the moment though, there are 7 million uh, of the 15 million who are not receiving antiretroviral therapy, although they urgently, urgently need it. There is still a gap. Despite the magnificence of PEPFAR, the Global Fund, uh, there's still a huge gap where we're not reaching uh, individuals. Also, for every 10 people that, are now, that we start on antiretroviral therapy in Africa, 15, uh, 16 people are newly infected. So we don't have a winning strategy yet for getting out in front of this virus. In, ter in terms of the money, a, a very, uh, uh, certainly I think resources is on everyone's minds these days. Uh, it's estimated in 2015 that we're going to need 26.6 billion. The best estimates, the absolute best estimates for, for the HIV budget in 2015 is going to be about uh, $8 billion available. So resources are slim. 230,000 AIDS deaths in children less than the age of 15 in 2011. 
Most of these deaths are occurring in sub-Saharan Africa. Also, 15 million children have been orphaned. Uh, 12 million of those orphans uh, live in Africa. So this really sets the stage for me uh, in terms of, is it possible to devise a safe and inexpensive, uh, and inexpensive therapy to stop the progression of HIV uh, disease in the millions of people in the developing world who currently have no access to antiretrovirals? Clearly, antiretrovirals is the way to go, but we're not, we don't have them, and people are progressing and dying of AIDS uh, without the benefit of these drugs. And what I'd like to tell you now is a scientific story that at the end I will loop back to the global health uh, ramifications and potential ramifications of the story. So let's start that despite 25 years of study, we still do not fully understand how HID, HIV depletes the CD4 T cells. And of course, it is this uh, is, that is the fundamental problem in AIDS. If you don't deplete the CD4 T cells, you don't develop the Im immunodeficiency characteristic of the disease. Two principal pathways for CD4 T cell depletion have been proposed. Of course, productive infection of, of, of this subset of cells and death of these cells by apoptosis. Uh, and, but, in it, but the number of productively infected cells does not appear anywhere close to explaining the massive CD4 T cell losses that occur in vivo, which then led to the idea that most of the, that most of the CD4 T cells are dying as bystanders, that, these, uh, that they're surrounding infected cells, but they themselves are not productively infected. We set out several years ago to begin studying how T cells are dying in lymphoid tissues. We chose lymphoid tissues to study because that's where 98% of the CD4 T cells reside. The tissues of choice were human tonsil and human spleen. Tonsil is a lot, more, a lot easier to get from the national uh, repositories, the tissue uh, distributors. But uh, interestingly, there are a number of spleens that become available often due to traumatic uh, injury. I'd like to specifically highlight the uh, contributions of Galad Deutsch, an extremely, he started as a postdoctoral fellow, has advanced now as the staff research investigator within uh, the laboratory and leads the HIV pathogenesis group. Uh, I'll begin also with Nicole Galloway, a, a BMS graduate student at UCSF, who's been part and parcel of all of these studies as well. Um, now, the, this is, this is the, taking tonsil cells and infecting with HIV. This particular variety of HIV expresses green fluorescence protein when a productive infection is established. You see that at by about, about day six of infection, there's about one and a half percent of the cells that are GFP positive and they have down-regulated CD4 indicative of productive infection. So in these tonsil tissues, without any addition of mitogens or other stimuli, no intentional addition of cytokines, you can get between 1 and 5 percent of the cell population uh, spontaneously infected with HIV. Interesting, at day 6, the CD4, the uninfected CD4 population that is GFP negative is, is quite well maintained, but note what happens three days later. There is an almost complete disappearance of the CD4 T cell compartment. These cells did not downregulate CD4 and move into this compartment. They were lost from the system. Now the question is, did they all get infected in three days, move up here, and then disappear before we could analyze them? Or in fact, is this a bystander death that these cells are dying by uh, as a result of bystander uh, effects? So we set out to understand that. We, of course, labeled those CD4 T cells so we could specifically follow them. What would, did we find? I will now tell you a story of an octet of, of surprises that, that emerged in these studies. The first surprise was that the dying bystander CD4 T cells, uh, they are in fact, the, the bystanders are what are dying, but they themselves are not, they are themselves abortively infected uh, with the virus. So they're not truly bystander cells. They have, few, they have taken up the virus, they've fused it, and they've begun reverse transcription but that reverse transcription, because of their resting state, is abortive. Um, and that, uh, that is a key fact that, 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 that allows, uh, and that's mediated by SAMHD1. So here are examples that looking at uh, CD4, uh, the bystander cells, the CD4 T cells versus the CD8 T cells versus the B cells. And we see that in the presence of either a laboratory adapted strain of HIV or a field isolate of HIV, 
that there is a significant depletion of the, of the bystander population of specifically the CD4 T cells. No depletion of the CD8 cells, no depletion of the B cells. That depletion can be rescued by the addition of an entry inhibitor, AMD3100, uh, which blocks X4 uh, viral uh, entry. Note that we did these infections or, or these assays in the presence of AZT. We did so to prevent or to exclude the possibility of productive infection within the bystander uh, population. However, because of the non-permissive nature of these cells, they're resting, they have SAMHD1. Uh, in fact, uh, the addition of AZT uh, is really overkill. It's not uh, necessary. So what's going on? So we, we then, we knew that these cells, we could prevent their death by the addition of AMD3100 by pr preventing entry. And we also know that in the presence of AZT, they would die. So we reasoned that there must be some event between the boundaries uh, indicated by these drugs that was critical for the death of these CD4 T cells. So we started marching in. So we asked, is fusion necessary? So we could add fusion inhibitors, and we found, in fact, or protease inhibitors, and we found, in fact, that the, the, the viruses were rescued from, this, from, the, uh, the, from the bystander death. Interestingly, as once we got inside the cell, we, we, we quickly realized that the addition of non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors led to the survival of the cell, whereas the chain uh, elongation inhibitors like AZT uh, did not uh, uh, salvage the cells from this. So it actually defined, if you will, a death window between the sites of action of these two uh, different classes of reverse transcriptase uh, uh, targeting uh, agents. So here, in fact, is the, uh, the, the level of killing that occurs in the absence or presence of AZT, and we see the rescue of this, of this killing by the addition of efavirenz or nevirapine. Uh, integrase inhibitors uh, uh, do, uh, are not effective at salvaging the cells from death. They, they act uh, too late uh, in the pathway. So we had no deaths with the NNRTIs. We had death in the presence of the AZT. This defined a very uh, def well-defined death window, and what appeared to be happening was the elongation of the DNA, the production of incomplete reverse transcripts, uh, which would terminate at varying times due to the presence of, uh, of the AZT or due to stalling under the effects of SAMHD1, that the accumulation of that cytoplasmic DNA appeared somehow involved in this death uh, signaling. The second uh, of the two surprises is that the cell death is not caused by the toxicity of, the H of HIV DNA, for example, or other products brought in by the virus, but instead is due to an innate immune response launched against the cytosolic viral DNA that accumulates in these non-permissive resting CD4 T cells. What's the nature of that innate uh, immune response? We see, in fact, that there's an activation of caspase-1. There's an activation of caspase 3, but not of 6, uh, 8, and 9. We also see that there is an activation of a variety of cytokines. IL-1 uh, beta is up. Interferon uh, beta is up. But interestingly, tumor necrosis factor alpha is not. Uh, we also see that in these, in these settings that the caspase 3, the caspase 1, for example, that we can block the, 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 the induction of, of, of caspase 1 if, in fact, we block the infection with efavirenz or we block with the T20 uh, fusion uh, uh, inhibitor. So there, that this is appear, it, the drug sensitivity of the appearance of caspase 1 precisely maps that uh, of the drug sensitivity of, of, of the cell death pathway. So what is being sensed here? What is it? Is it viral RNA? Is it RNA-DNA hybrids? Or is it possibly just viral DNA? We have the advantage of using uh, the availability of an H35 hepatoma cell line that contained an, uh, an interferon response element linked to a GFP reporter. And so we could challenge these hepatoma cells with various synthetic forms of HIV RNA or DNA that corresponded to different products made during reverse transcription. Now, interestingly, these H35 hepatoma cells also died in a manner in a drug sensitivity similar to that uh, of resting CD4 uh, T cells. First thing we found is that looking at, uh, uh, at uh, viral RNA, uh, uh, the capped, uh, the strong stop DNA, the RNA-DNA uh, uh, 
heteroduplexes. Uh, we saw no evidence of, of that these uh, agents, when exposed to the transfected or nucleofected into the H35 cells, uh, were having any death-inducing uh, uh, ability or the ability to induce uh, or to activate the uh, interferon-sensitive GFP reporter. However, as soon as we started introducing either single-strand or double-strand DNAs that were longer than 150 base pairs, reaching 500 base pairs, now suddenly we began to see a signal, an, a GFP signal. And interestingly, this signal was as strong as the signal elicited by poly-IC, which is a potent activator of the Rig I uh, pathway within these uh, cells. The third surprise. The third surprise is that the dying cells do not go quietly into the night. Rather, they die by a process called pyrotosis, which is an intensely inflammatory form of programmed cell death. So here I summarize uh, pyrotosis. It is mediated by the activation of caspase-1 with, uh, assembled within inflammasomes. The caspase-1 also within the inflammasome processes at least two pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18, into their bioactive forms. And in addition, the cytosolic contents uh, of, of a cell undergoing pyrotosis, the cytosolic contents are released uh, through, about, uh, uh, through pores that are caused, uh, uh, that are leading to the intense inflammation, as well as now the escape of the processed IL-1 beta and, and IL-18. You may recall that caspase-1 used to be called ICE or interleukin-1 converting uh, enzyme. Now this is strikingly different from apoptosis, often mediated through caspase-3 activation, which is a very, it's a cellular form of uh, programmed cell death, dismantling of the cell, but it does so in a very quiet, non-inflammatory way due to the fact that these apoptotic bodies are, are produced and that they're gobbled up uh, by macrophages uh, and, and essentially a very few or little inflammatory contents are released into the extracellular uh, space. So we set out to now uh, try and understand or try and prove to ourselves whether or not pyrotosis was involved. We had evidence for caspase-1, but is caspase-1 really activated within these CD4 uh, T cells? Whoops. I forgot to introduce you to Kate Monroe, a postdoctoral fellow who's carried out many of, uh, of these studies. Uh, and she, the first question is, caspase-1 activated during the abortive infection of resting uh, CD4 T cells? And shown here is the depletion of the CD4 T cells. We see that on day uh, two, day three, day four, that there is a progressive decline such that here there's about seven, only 7% 7 of the original 16.4% of cells uh, uh, present. Now, interestingly, if one looks on day three, uh, which is one day in advance of the, the, of the sharp decline in CD4 T cell numbers, we see that in the HIV infected uh, cells that there 60.5% of them are now expressing an active form of caspase-1 and that this can be blocked down to nearly basal levels by the addition of efavirenz or AMD3100, uh, uh, and even higher levels, uh, the positive control in the experiment, nigerosin, uh, which can activate very high-level uh, caspase-1 expression in these cells. So then we, then we asked, if, uh, does caspase, do caspase-1 inhibitors effectively block the depletion of these CD4 T cells? Sure enough, we can rescue almost completely uh, the, the, these cells from dying by the addition of a caspase-1 inhibitor. However, a caspase-3 in, inhibitor essentially has no uh, uh, effect, uh, nor does a caspase-6 inhibitor uh, versus the control. Also, we asked, uh, do caspase-1 inhibitors block the formation of these uh, pores in the membrane and release of cytoplasmic contents as judged by the uh, percent release of lactic dehydrogenase? We see that, uh, that in, the, in, uh, in the presence of infection, in the absence of any drugs, that there is a release of, uh, of LDH that's blocked by efavirenz or AMD3100. It's equally well blocked by caspase-1 inhibitors, but not blocked by the caspase-3 uh, inhibitors. So this looks all the world like there's poor formation occurring, there's a, an obligate dependence upon uh, uh, on, on caspase-1 uh, activation. Any chance, though, given this poor formation, that what we're really looking at might be necrotosis, 
or the old, this the new term, uh, recognizing that it too is a programmed form of cell death involving the RIP1 and RIP3 kinases, uh, the old term uh, being necrosis. So we did, uh, we did ask whether necrostatin, a potent inhibitor of the RIP1 kinase, it locks it into an inactive uh, form. We asked whether necrostatin could block the uh, depletion, uh, and we see that necrostatin, the, cell, the CD4 T cells continued to die in the presence of necrostatin, and LDH continued to be released, so pore formation uh, persisted in the presence of necrostatin, uh, arguing against the involvement of necrotosis in this process. So the fourth of the, of the octet of surprises was that tissue CD4 T cells turn out to be uniquely primed for the release of IL-1 beta and other inflammatory mediators. In contrast, the CD8 T cells and the B cells in the same cultures are not primed. Let me show you the primary data for that. So this is spleen and this is tonsil. The asterisks indicate where we've done FICOL high-paking to, to, to further purify out uh, living tonsil cells. Um, and we see that, in fact, in these, in, in these settings, there is high-level constitutive expression of IL-1 beta within these cells. Uh, now, again, you, know, you could argue, well, the, maybe the tonsil was infected, because usually tonsillitis is the mechanism that, or the, the underlying condition that requires tonsillectomy. But certainly, that's not the case with the spleen. Uh, where, in fact, constitutive expression of, of pro-IL-1 beta is, is obvious. Now, if you start to, to ask which cells are expressing the IL-1 beta, you find it in the CD4 T cell subset, not in the 8s, not in the B cells, and, of course, you can see it in the whole HLAC uh, population as well. Now, interestingly, if you further drill into the CD4 population and ask which of the CD4 cells have it, Interestingly, if you look at CCR5 expressing cells, which have been a level of activation, uh, these uh, often will wind up being memory cells, we see high levels uh, of IL-1, pro-IL-1 beta in those cells, uh, whereas lower levels within the CCR5 negative population. And then if you now infect these populations of cells, just HIV infection alone uh, is sufficient because of the priming, uh, with, uh, the expression of pro-IL-1 beta. Uh, HIV infection delivers the second signal, um, uh, activation of caspase-1, that leads now to cleavage of pro-IL-1 beta and the release of bioactive uh, IL-1 beta into the uh, supernatant. And we see that that is particularly pronounced with, uh, when, when one uses cultures of CCR5 positive cells. All of this leads us to the following model in the tonsil. About 5% of the cells are permissive to HIV infection. Here, when the virus fuses, it undergoes processive reverse transcription. Uh, it, uh, the double-stranded DNA is formed, is integrated, and, and new virions are produced. But ultimately, these productively infected cells die by an, an apo uh, apoptotic uh, mechanism of cell death involving uh, likely caspase 3 activation. In contrast, the vast majority of CD4 T cells that are dying uh, in the tonsil tissue are not productively infected with HIV. Rather, it is the spread of the virus from these cells to these non-permissive resting CD4 T cells Fusion occurs normally, but then there is this block at the level of reverse transcription, mediated at least in part by SAMHD1, that leads to the accumulation of incomplete reverse transcripts. These reverse transcripts are sensed, uh, the DNA is sensed by an yet-to-be-identified sensor, but that sensing leads to the activation of innate antiviral response uh, and an inflammatory response uh, uh, encompassing inflammasome assembly, caspase-1 activation, and active death with uh, a pore formation uh, and, and uh, active inflammation uh, uh, via pyrotosis. And so that 95 percent of the cells dying in the system are dying by this abortive infection mechanism, where only a very small percent, perhaps as much as 5 percent, are dying as a result of productive infection. So in this model of, ad of abortive infection and caspase one mediated pyrotosis, uh, is, can we find support for this model in patients? 
what if we took a lymph node from, some, from an HIV-infected subject? Would we see any evidence in that lymph node uh, to support this type of, uh, of model developed in an ex vivo histo, uh, lymphoid histoculture uh, uh, process? So, in fact, we had access recently to an HIV-infected lymph node from an individual who was in the chronic phase of, of HIV infection but had elected to go off of antiretroviral therapy. This individual had a viral load of 87,000 and a CD4 count of 227 per microliter. Now, we did three things here. We're going to look at where P24 GAG is being produced, where caspase-1 is being activated, and where IL-1 beta is being produced. So to, to orient you, this is the germinal center. Uh, this is the cortex and the pericortical uh, region. Uh, and we see that the P24 is occur occurring within the germinal center, specifically in what's called the lymphoid wall of, 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 the, uh, of the germinal center. So a very circumscribed region is where the virus, where productively infected cells are, are, are occurring. In contrast, if you look at where the caspase-1 activation is occurring, it is occurring in the paracortical uh, region surrounding the germinal center. It's as if these productively infected cells are creating abortive infection in these cells, these resting cells outside of the germinal center, leading to caspase-1 activation, and sure enough, to the production of copious quantities of IL-1 uh, uh, beta in this paracortical uh, region as well. So just slicing across this lymph node from a patient who was untreated, essentially recapitulating many of the conclusions that we saw uh, in, the, in the HLAC uh, culture. So what do we think is going on? We think, in fact, that this normally protective response, we think that the CD4 T cell is signaling to die principally as a protective mechanism for the host. But in the case of HIV infection, this goes uh, awry. Uh, we think that the, the abortive infection leads to the pyrotosis, the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, cellular contents, that this level of inflammation results in chemokine release, the recruitment of new healthy CD4 T cells to the zone of inflammation. So one sets up a, just a vicious cycle of infection, pyrotosis, inflammation, new cell recruitment that just grinds away and chews up the CD4 T cells in, in, a, in, um, uh, in a very persuasive uh, manner. So in this regard, bystander CD4 T cell death occurring during HIV infection, which is the major mechanism of, of CD4 depletion, is, is mainly occurring as a result of cellular suicide. It's not a murder. The murder is the HIV productively infected cells, but most of the cells are dying as a result of an innate immune response, suicide to try and protect the host that unfortunately uh, does not protect the host. Also, the detection of pyrotosis provides a new mechanism linking chronic inflammation to HIV infection. Previously, it was thought that most of the chronic inflammation stems from the, the development of a mucosal link in the gut, and that certainly may be contributing to the chronic inflammation. But we think that in, uh, we also think that this pyrototic mechanism, uh, whereby the, the death of CD4 T cells is also triggering an associated inflammation, is, is an attractive mechanism for, for, uh, uh, for sustaining long-term chronic inflammation. So finally, let's, uh, to the fifth of the octet of surprises, Interestingly, circulating peripheral blood, we said, okay, we're tired of studying tonsil and spleen. We can't get them as much as we want. Let's do it in blood. So we turned to blood cells, and it turns out that blood CD4 T cells are completely resistant to this form of CD4 T cell killing. If we had started with these cells, as been the case in 90 plus percent of HIV studies, we would have completely missed the abortive infection innate immune killing uh, mechanism. Let me show you, you have uh, the Isa, Isa who's here, Isa Munoz Arias is a graduate student from UC Berkeley. She is the one that is really leading our efforts on the peripheral blood mononuclear cell uh, CD4 uh, question. Um, and what she has found 
is the following. Here is if you do a tonsil culture where the tonsils are infected and the tonsils are being killed by the effectors, very nice depletion of the CD4 T cells. If you set up the same experiment, viral infection using peripheral blood mononuclear cells as effectors and targets, there's no killing. Now you say, well, maybe I need to activate the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Still no killing. Only, killing only occurs is when you mix tonsil and peripheral blood mononuclear cells together. Now the tonsils can either be the effector cell or they can be the target cell. As long as you have tonsil in the system, the, the death, uh, the, the death uh, 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 CD4 T cell depletion is uh, returned. Now interestingly, you can, if you put the tonsil on the opposite side of a trans well, um, in fact, no death occurs. So there needs to be a close cell-to-cell -cell interaction between the tonsil in order for it to confer upon the peripheral blood CD4 T cell uh, the ability to be killed uh, by, uh, by HIV. Now we then asked, well, if the tonsil and the peripheral blood have to be in close opposition, is, does the virus have to come from the tonsil cell to kill the peripheral blood lymphocyte? So Issa set up this experiment where she can preferentially infect the peripheral blood lymphocyte and then ask whether or not the presence of the tonsil is sufficient as a third party is sufficient to allow the killing uh, of the peripheral blood CD4 T cell. And these studies take advantage of a single cycle virus, an integrase mutant, and so that once it moves from the 293 cell into the peripheral blood lymphocyte, it can't go anywhere else. But if, in fact, tonsil is present in the culture system, not infected, uh, but just present as a third party, in fact, that is sufficient to su support uh, the death of, uh, of, the C of the peripheral blood CD4 T cell. So if you want to learn more about this intriguing, absolutely fascinating blood CD4 T cell resistance to abortive infection and pyrotosis, Issa is giving her poster tomorrow uh, afternoon, number 124. The sixth of the octet of surprises, innate production of inter interferon beta occurs, as I've shown you, uh, during the abortive infection, but it does not appear to be part and parcel of the CD4 T cell death pathway. We had previously hypothesized that maybe these DNA intermediates are being sensed by a DAI-like sensor that then elicits an interferon response that perhaps elicits a second, uh, that in, induces the appearance of a second sensor like AIM-2, which is induced by interferon, and maybe AIM-2 is recognizing the HIV DNA in the context of an inflammasome and, and triggering the caspase-1. So this pathway would put, it would be a serial pathway whereby type 1 interferon production would be important for killing. So we tested that pathway by blocking the interferon, the alpha beta receptor with, a, with an antibody, uh, and we see that in fact killing persists in the presence of an interferon blockade. And to show that in fact the blockade is sufficient, we can show that this antibody does block stat phospho, uh, phospho, tyrosine uh, phosphorylation of, uh, of STAT1. So this leaves us with a model whereby the DNA, uh, the accumulating reverse transcription intermediates in the cell it appears that there could be a separate or a common sensor that leads to caspase 3 activation, apoptosis, and the interferon pathway, and either a second sensor or maybe a common sensor that also independently activates the inflammasome, caspase 1, um, uh, pyrototic pathway that leads to uh, uh, cell death. So these pathways are not contingent upon each other. The nature of the sensor or sensors that, that, that mediate these responses remains uh, unidentified. But that brings me precisely to this question. Can we identify that HIV DNA sensor or sensors? And these are studies that have been uh, carried out by Z, uh, Zhiwan Yang, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory. Uh, he's the one who actually defined 7SK RNA in the Hexam uh, uh, PTFB uh, uh, complex at, at Berkeley. Uh, so he's a well-trained biochemist. He set out to take a biochemical approach to, to trying to purify the sensor uh, using uh, uh, biotinylated HIV DNA and then incubating these DNAs either single or double-stranded with uh, CD4 T-cell lysates uh, 
ultimately purifying the proteins associated with that, analyzing by gel electrophoresis and silver staining. This is the kind of pattern that, that we would get from tonsil versus blood. Now, one idea was that maybe the sensor is missing in blood, and that's why they're not dying, but present in tonsil. Well, ultimately, we collaborated with Nevin Krogan and identified all of the, uh, you know, many of the associated proteins uh, with the HIV DNA. This list is shown here. A number of DNA damage uh, repair uh, uh, proteins, a number of uh, innate immunity, for example, IFIX, uh, TREX1, um, the IFI16. So there are a number of inter potentially interesting uh, uh, proteins that might be functioning as sensors uh, within this list. Now, how do you go about prosecuting that list? Well, obviously, you want to knock down those genes in the resting CD4 T cell, but that's not an easy task. The reason is that these resting CD4 T cells, these primary resting CD4 T cells, are renowned for their poor transfectability with almost any agent, and you can't use lentiviral shRNA vectors because of the SAMHD1 mediated restriction uh, of lentiviral growth within these cells. But of course, the studies by Kepler and Vinkaran uh, have shown that HIV2's VPX has the ability to degrade SAMHD1, thereby opening a gateway, if you will, in resting CD4 T cells that we thought might allow us to get lentiviral shRNA vectors into these cells. So we decided to test that, that possibility. And by we, I mean uh, Xin Gang, who has performed these studies. And what Xin has found is the following. Uh, he's doing a, this is a proof of principle experiment where he's taking an shRNA uh, directed against NALP3, an inflammasome component, and, and asking whether or not lentiviral knockdown of NALP3 is sufficient to rescue uh, these cells from nigerosin-induced pyrotosis, uh, the resting CD4 T cells from pyrotosis. So he's going to add an shRNA, which is linked to an m cherry reporter, uh, after uh, viral-like particles uh, coated with, uh, with a, a pseudotype with HIV OMV are first added, then the lentiviral infection is performed, and now then we're going to look at, at three days later adding nigerosin and see whether knockdown of NALP3 is sufficient to rescue these cells from uh, pyrotosis. So uh, the cells uh, trans, uh, infected with a scrambled uh, shRNA uh, shows uh, death, uh, uh, nigerosin-induced induced death. Now, in the absence of nigerosin, not, no one dies. But if you knock down NALP3, uh, you see that in the mCherry NALP3 shRNA expressing cells, there is a rescue of these cells uh, from uh, pyrotosis, in contrast, the M cherry negative, the, those cells in the culture that did not receive the shRNA uh, continue to die normally. So the VPX technology, I think, is going to revolutionize our ability to access and to be able to now prosecute the various ca sensor candidates that we have uh, by using the lentiviral shRNAs, which are highly efficient after the VLP VPX gateway uh, is used. The seventh of the octet of surprises. Abortive infection and pyrotosis requires close cell-to-cell -cell contact with transmission of HIV across a virological synapse. Cell-free viruses do not suffice. So the cells have to be physically very close and a virological synapse must be formed. Now we knew very early on when we did Transwell experiments with the tonsil cultures that in the trans well, uh, very few of the CD4 T cells died. In contrast, if they were mixed, we got nice CD4 T cell depletion. So we knew that close, that we knew that interactions between these cells was, was important. Initially, though, we, we set out to use spinoculation, we, and we hypothesized that we could capit recapitulate the requirement for close cell-cell interaction by viral spinoculation, essentially by creating a viral tsunami, a, just a wave of virus coming into these cells, approximating what we thought was occurring uh, uh, in, when cells were in close contact. And sure enough, you can do that with spinoculation. We can see that in isolated CD4 T cells that we can get 62% uh, of the cells fusing uh, uh, virus. 
and that's blockable by AMD 3100. In the HLAC culture, 40, uh, almost 50% of the culture fusing uh, virus. So very high level virus. However, if we then do, if, we, if we're using a multiple round virus, a virus that can spread through the culture, we see, as predicted, the depletion of the CD4 T cells, dropping from 36%, so almost a 90% depletion of the CD4 T cells, rescuable by AMD 3100. However, if we had spinoculated in one of those single round viruses that can't spread, we saw no depth whatsoever. In fact, uh, this was really surprising to us. But what was happening was the spinoculation wasn't creating a tsunami of viruses. What it was doing was to create a small population of productively infected cells in the, in the culture. And it was these productively infected cells that were now spreading the virus to the target CD4 T cells across. And we asked, uh, uh, is it going to be across a virological synapse or not? and causing the death of these cells. What we didn't know then is, it, is it a virological synapse-mediated response, or is it just close proximity with kind of high-intensity release of virus onto the surface of, of the target cell? So we decided to test whether or not the virological synapse was required uh, by using, taking advantage of the fact that ICAM-1 and LFA-1 are partners that form key components of, of this synapse. And we found that, in fact, when we used antibodies against ICAM-1 in a dose-related way, we could rescue CD4 T cell death by breaking up uh, the synapse with an anti-ICAM-1 antibody or by breaking up uh, uh, the, the synapse with an anti-LFA-1 uh, antibody. So, uh, and then, then we said, okay, so cell-cell interaction important, virological synapse important. If that's true, we could also decrease the cell-cell interaction by increasing the surface area of the culture vessel, and we should also see in that situation that there would be less uh, killing. So we took 96-well V-bottom versus U-bottom versus flat-bottom versus 24-well and 12-well, and sure enough, you can titrate the amount of killing based on the amount of surface area that, that is present which uh, the, the larger the surface area, clearly the less opportunity for the cells to participate in, in meaningful cell-cell uh, interactions. So all of these data lead us to the conclusion that, in fact, that cell-to-cell -cell spread of HIV is required for the activation of this uh, pyrotonic uh, bystander, a pyrotonic uh, death uh, pathway, and that the spread does occur across a virological uh, synapse. So the intimate, I mean, that, and, and I think the lymph node that we have, the infinite, the intimate interaction of cells within the germinal center with those in the surrounding cortex and paracortex is supportive of that. Now I'd like to circle back in the last minute uh, to the issues about wh how, what these findings might open or what they might provide in terms of a new anti-AIDS therapy that could potentially benefit those millions of people who are infected in the world with no access to antiretroviral therapy. How could we break this pathogenic cycle of infection, pyrotosis, inflammation, new infections, this round after round? Well, one approach might be to use caspase-1 inhibitors or other inhibitors of the inflammasome. Now, it just so happens that Vertex has a drug called 765, which is a highly selectively or selective orally bioavailable caspase 1 inhibitor that they have tested in chronic seizure disorder and decided to drop, even though it, was, it worked, it didn't work well enough in that particular setting. But what they have found is that this drug is extremely safe in, in people, little to no toxicity in phase 2A uh, clinical trials. Uh, it's a 100 to a 10,000 uh, fold more active against caspase 1 than other caspases. It's being evaluated in a number of chronic inflammatory uh, conditions. Now, interestingly, VX765 uh, comes as a prodrug versus the active compound. It turns out that the, co that the, uh, the, the prodrug has an ester group here, which makes it more membrane permeant. Uh, and once inside the cell, esterase acts upon it to create the active form of the drug. And sure enough, 
in our CD4 T cell killing assay, we find that the membrane permeable form, VX765, the prodrug, has very nice dose-related inhibition uh, of CD4 T cell depletion, whereas the less permeant uh, uh, act but active compound uh, has less activity, both in tonsil and in spleen. And finally, I would just circle back and, and make the point that this may, this this idea of an anti-AIDS attacking a host pathway as opposed to the virus, then in fact the evolutionary solution to the lentiviral challenge is not to control the virus, but rather to control the host response to the virus. For example, we know that in non-pathogenic lentiviral infections, like the Sudi Mangabees or the African Greens, that these are, these are naturally infected animals, they have high viremia. The, the viruses in the test tube can deplete CD4 T cells. Uh, but in vivo, there's little or no CD4 uh, T cell depletion. There's no simian AIDS, there's no inflammation or immune activation, and our preliminary data suggests there's little or no caspase 1 activation. So we think that these animals may have evolved to, to lose the pyrotonic pathway. They can still, uh, they can still uh, caspase 3 and direct productive infection, but those minor CD4 T cell losses are, are quickly replaced. Uh, <clears throat> in contrast, if you take species that are not naturally infected, like humans and the rhesus macaque, we see high viremia, we see the CD4 depletion both in vitro and in vivo, we see progression to AIDS, we see all kinds of inflammation and immune activation in these species, and caspase 1, of course, uh, is activated. And we, we have pretty solid data in the rhesus macaques now that caspase 1 is activated. So, it's possible that manipulation of this pathway could play a, a, at least a contributing role in determining whether a lentiviral infection is going to be pathogenic or not, and that this, this is the evolutionary solution that has played out apparently in, in more than 40 species of, of African monkeys infected with their own specific uh, retroviruses. So in summary, abortive infection and innate immunity uh, uh, against viral DNA drive most of the CD4 T cell depletion occurring in HIV infection. Caspase 1 dependent pyrotosis is a major active pathway producing inflammation. There's this vicious cycle of infection, pyrotosis, inflammation, and recruitment of new cells that just keeps grinding and grinding and chewing up CD4 cells. Cell to cell transmission appears required. PBLs are high, CD4 cells circulating in the blood are highly resistant to this mechanism of death. And then finally, the, I, the concept of that non-pathogenicity uh, non may involve evolutionary changes affecting the caspase one pyrotonic uh, pathway. What are the open questions? Well, certainly, the open question, one open question is what are the cytoplasmic sensor or sensors that uh, detect the HIV DNA reverse transcripts uh, and elicit the innate immune and inflammatory responses that kill the CD4 cells? What is the nature of the inflammasome that is recruiting caspase 1 uh, into these, uh, and active in these CD4 cells? What are the strategies that HIV employs to escape detection from this innate immune system in productively infected cells? And then finally, how do productively infected cells, CD4 T cells die? Is it really by caspase 3 and apoptosis? Um, are there situations where productively infected cells might also participate in, in, in other forms of, of, of programmed cell death, for example, in the gut where, where permeability is, is lost. So just in conclusion, I want to thank the, the, my laboratory. They've been wonderful and uh, worked their rears off on, the, on this story. Uh, Galad Deutsch, Nicole Galloway, Issa Munoz Arias, Kate Monroe, Zhuan Yang, uh, Shen Gang, and I'd also like to thank the various sources of funding, NIH, Sable Trust, California HIV Research Program, and the UCSF Gladstone Center for AIDS Research. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Do you or me? So wow. what is your favorite model as to why in the pseudomangabies when you should have the same uh, pyroptosis or same sensing, it doesn't occur with uh, 
the so it's a good question. I don't know where the pathway is, um, where it's short circuited yet. We don't know that. But if you take the tonsils from the pseudomangabe, we we'll take lymph node. Or lymph node. Yeah. You don't get. And this. we don't. And we, you know, preliminary data. It's preliminary. That we don't see caspase one activation. We see caspase three activation, but not caspase one. But a very preliminary result. First, that was a tour de force. Well, thank you. And the second thing is, I would like some rationalization of why AMD 3100 is effective. Is, is, it, is it you found a new role for AMD 3100, or it really requires CXCR4? So the viruses that we have used in almost all of these studies are export tropic viruses, uh, and that's why we've chosen AMD 3100. And that's because in the tonsil, uh, we think the same type of, of process plays out in CCR5 expressing cells. Of course, those CCR5 expressing cells have to have achieved a sufficient state of rest that they are no longer permissive to infection and that they undergo the abortive form of infection. And we can certainly find CCR5 expressing cells that are like that. It's just that they're not very plentiful in number in the tonsil or in the spleen. Yes. What about elite controllers? Um, did you think about those? I mean, are they like the Sudimangabes or? Um, is well, the elite controllers have very low viral load. The Sudimangabes have very high viral load. So they are kind of opposite sides of the coin. Uh, they need not, neither develop disease, but the mechanism would appear to be quite different in, the, in those settings. Um, if in, in going back to old trials, so Warner, um, I'm sorry, where here, are you? Right okay. Here. <laughs> going back to old trials when you had mono and, and dual combination therapy with just NRTIs, would it, if you're looking at the rebound of CD4, and I know this is now peripheral, but is there a possibility that this was leading to um, uh, apoptosis and cell death and so that the rebound was slower? So, you know, it's intriguing to think about, well, would regimens with an NRTI, uh, would, they, would, would those people do better? Now, remember, though, that what's needed for this, for this effect is virus. I mean, you need virus. So anti, any antiviral, no matter where it works in the pathway, as if you're looking at a spreading infection, any antiviral is going to interfere with this because it, it blocks the accumulation of virus needed to drive. But in a single cycle, in a single cycle virus, you could, you could potentially, in, over one cycle, you could see a differential effect of an NNRTI versus a RT. Yeah, I guess my question is more related to like when we were doing monotherapies with NRTIs versus NNRTIs. The NNRTIs usually drove down uh, viral load and faster rebounds of CD4, and the NRTIs sometimes were slower to get a rebound in yeah. CD4. Could that be some killing Maybe. bystander effects? I think John thinks not. 3TC was it? Yeah. So there yeah. are people with mutations in caspase 1, so which have reduced enzymatic activities. Have you looked in such patients whether they are less prone to the AIDS no. phenotype? No, we've not, we've not done that. It's a good idea. Yes. I'm sorry, I must be a little tired here, but I didn't understand the difference between the nevirapine and then the AZT. How, do they form, how would they form different DNA fragments? So the idea, the, the concept is that the nevirapine and the efavirenz as non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which are allosteric inhibitors of the enzyme, may catch the enzyme and not allow it to elongate very early in initiation, whereas the, uh, whereas the chain terminators allow more. Now, that's one idea. The other possibility is that uncoding, that uncoding is also uh, involved here, and that nevirapine and efavirenz may be differentially compared to the, the, the nukes uh, affecting the uncoating reaction. And that's, uh, we're, we're studying that now. But there's no question there is a dramatic, dramatic difference between the effects of a non-nuke and a nuke in this, in this. Well, what would you predict for RNA-SH inhibitors? RNA-SH inhibitors also will, will prevent uh, this, I mean, we looked at mutants of RNA-SH and they also prevent the cell killing. They're like a fabric. And uh, just the last question, uh, do they have to be HIV sequences? Do what? 
do the DNA fragments have to be HIV sequenced? No, they do not. No, as you know, no. No, you could do this with plasma DNA. Is it possible? Because it's it's sensing DNA. It's not sensing sequen in a sequence specific way. It's seeking se sequence. It's seeking sensing DNA. Is it possible that uh, the difference between PBMC and tonsil is the difference in the mode of cell to cell transmission? It's possible. Um, I mean, we set up. I mean, it's also it's also possible that PBLs or CD4 T cells circulating in blood might not have the sensor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there's a number of possibilities that we're exploring right now. I, I, I was wondering um, <clears throat> if there was a, another explanation for the difference between NNRTI and the NRTI differences. Namely, uh, they both inhibit RT, but NRTIs can also affect the DNTP pool, uh, pool balance, right? They can call, cause an imbalance of the DNTPs. Could that be uh, playing a role here? Could be. Could be. Over here. I think it's just following that question, actually. So I was looking at that uh, VPX and uh, that lentivirus SHRA data, and that result looks amazing. So it looks like a VPX really worked well there to allow the lentivirus infection. I'm wondering if VPX treatment could also block this bystander cell test. It does. You, when you use VPX, you redirect killing into the caspase three pathway and away from the caspase one pathway. Your, 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 uh, your guess is absolutely correct. Okay. A last question is about that cell to cell spread. I'm wondering, since compare your single round virus and the multi cycle, the real virus, the result, is it possible that all the cells need is actually newly synthesized the virus from a T cell? So that I don't know if ever, anybody ever observed this, that a new virus may have some, let's say, T cell signal molecules incorporated in the virus. Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I, will, I may ask you later. Uh, basically, I'm just wondering the new virus produced by the productively infected T cells, yes. is it possible they are carrying some T cell mole signal molecule? You know, uh, absolutely. I think there's, uh, I, is the virion carrying it? We know that the, the lymphoid factor necessary, the lymphoid tissue factor, that the, the, that cell does not have to be infected with the virus. So it doesn't, so you wouldn't have to say that the virion's picking it up and moving it across. It can be a third party. But, so there's, there's two cell-cell interactions that are necessary. The, the lymphoid factor to confer upon CD4 T cells death but it's, that's, not a, um, uh, that's not a virological synapse issue. And then there's the T cell to T cell spread, synapse important, contact critical, um, and w w what, uh, you know, I guess that I, I'm suspecting that's high intensity delivery of DNA uh, of, of virions and then the accumulation of sufficient DNA to overwhelm TREX1 is my guess for, for why that's required. So. Hi, Warner. Yes. <laughs> it's sort of an extension of that. Um, so you, you're proposing that the pri pro IL-1 beta priming is perhaps a, a critical factor here. Yeah. And you showed that that's primarily present, this activation, in R5 positive CD4 cells. Right. And you're using an X4 virus. And you're claiming that entry is required for the bystander Death. Well, of course, the R5, the R5 expressing cells also have X4. So they're dual tropic. Well, no. I mean, they're dual receptor bearing oh, yeah. cells. Yeah, you almost ah, you, okay. you find X4 everywhere. It's only R5 that is is more restricted. So yes. we can still get into those cells. And then, are you can you tie your story about Africa to this story? You didn't really well, bring that together. So VX765. So VX765. If it's it's safe. Can we make it inexpensive? And can we give it, could we distribute it to millions and millions of people to keep them, to, to keep them from progressing, uh, you know, keep their CD4 counts high? In other words, make them like Sudi Mangabees until antiretroviral therapy is available. I mean, it's, I, I, you know, millions of people are dying and with no hope. 
we've got to do, we have to, it's a bridge. It's a bridge to antiretroviral therapy, but it's an absolutely key life-saving bridge that we don't have. Yeah, so many, many of you are interested why the uh, NRTIs don't work, but the NR, NNRTIs work. And Louis Agosto next to me, I think, uh, has an answer to this question because in a poster on Thursday night, 262, he shows that the NRTIs fail in cell-to-cell -cell transmission. They don't work in cell-to-cell -cell transmission. They are not effective. And the NNRTIs, most of them work. So you, you need to go through RT, you need to uncode. That's, you need this signal. So you think encoding is a key part of it? Yeah, these inhibitors yeah. don't work in cell to cell transmission. Okay. So, uh, you showed some beautiful p pictures uh, showing segregation of the killing zones and where, where IL 1 beta was activated and the productively infected cells, and yet you think the synapse is important. So, do you, do you, can you speculate how? You think that the cells might be synapsing? Or yeah, together. I think that there's interactions across from, from the germal center and across into so the cortex and periphery. Are they, in fact, adjacent to one another, close yeah. enough to synapse? Oh, yeah. And, and remember, it's on that lymphoid wall, which is the outer surface of the germinal center, and that immediately is abutting the cortex and the paracortex, which is uh, where we see the, uh, the caspase 1 uh, activation and the IL 1 beta. So these cells are right up against, I mean, it, it's an amazing demarcate. I mean, it, it was amazing when we saw these, these images that, but, you know, here's the infected cells, and uh, it's almost like Terry Finkel's uh, studies previously, showing that the bystander cells are often uh, right next to an infected cell, the dying bystander cell. Sorry, <laughs> once more going back to the Zotimangabe, um, there are some cohorts which uh, have a CD4 T cell depletion and do not develop disease. Do you have some of these animals included in your preliminary da data? No, we do not. Okay. No. We're aware of those animals. There are also, there are also humans that are sooty like and we're, we're accessing now lymphoid tissue from them as well. Are you arguing that there is a new DNA sensor that is because you've eliminated DAI or an AIM type receptor? We're working hard on the sensor. And, um, but you've eliminated the known ones? We're working hard on the sensor. <laughs> Warner, do you think that you could just add the NTPs exogenously and then reduce apoptosis? Well, yeah, you, c you can add deoxynucleotide triphosphates and get a, you know, uh, some relief of the SAMHD1 restriction, which will now shunt, uh, which will now make the cell more permissive, uh, but that's not nearly as effective as BPX. In, but you can, we can clearly with BPX direct these, uh, the virus, even in the absence of activation, down one pathway or the other. And, uh, I know that Guido Silvestri has identified a very rare group of people that have high viral loads, HIV infected people that don't progress. Are, do these you, are the do, human, are you studying these are the them? Suities. These are the human yeah, they suities. Yeah, they are the so-called human suities. They don't, I should not say that, but so <laughs> do they have uh, any defects in caspase one activation or is this we not We don't know yet. We're just at, beginning to access those tissues now. <laughs> oh, there's still more people. Okay, so two more and then. Two more in the meal. Okay. So, so I wonder if your model might be more relevant to the highly pathogenic na nature of x trophic viruses. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So I wonder if your model might be more relevant to the highly uh, high pathogenesis, pathogenesis of an x trophic virus. You can imagine that the, there'll be a lot, the X, cells expressing CXR4 will be a lot more nu numerous and will be susceptible to, through depletion. But most people are infected with R5 tropic right. viruses and they still get AIDS. And the frequency of the CCR5 positive cells is much lower. Uh, maybe just as a note, because you mentioned the SUTIs, actually, some of you may not be aware that there are actually infections with X4 tropic viruses in SUTIs, and these viruses wipe out all the CD4 cells. 
in Sooties, and the animals are still fine six years after infection without, so it's uh, CD4 cells. Don Zodora has shown this, and I think it's just interesting to keep in mind CD4 cells and the Sooties are not everything. But I think that I, you know, your question is well taken. One that we thought a lot about is this, uh, are we studying uh, principally the mechanism of depletion when the virus half the time shifts over to an export tropism? Or is this also relevant to R5? And I think, that, I, think that I favor the, the idea that it's also relevant to R5 because there are resting CD4 memory cells that are R5 expressing that have return to a uh, almost a resting state and therefore would be susceptible to abortive infection. Um, now, I agree with you, um, you know, if you're in the GALT, there's a lot of those cells. And I think that I would not be surprised if we see some pyrotosis occurring in the GALT if the CCR5 expressing cells have reached a sufficient state of rest. Um, and that's something we're trying also to do now. I will say that in contrast to tonsil, and spleen, it is almost impossible to get good GALT. You can't ship anything overnight and, and use lymphoid tissue from the gut. You have to get surgical specimens, otherwise you're up the creek. Thank you. So one very last brief question before the beer and poster. Yeah, <laughs> very brief. Um, in the patient uh, lymph node biopsy you showed, uh, was that patient infected with an X4 virus or R5 virus? The which patient? The lymph node biopsy which you showed uh, with we, the staining? Uh, we believe it's R5, but we're, re, uh, we're going back and, and uh, asking uh, for it to be retyped. It is, it's, you know, we, we're not absolutely sure. It's been presumed to be R5, but we need to know whether it could be dual tropic. Okay, thanks a lot, Warner.